Welcome back to 162, everybody. Um, I don't know if you're uh, like me, it's uh, pretty hard to turn away from the continuous state counts in the election, but uh, let's get to some operating systems. Um, we've been talking about how to actually store uh, information on devices and give, it, give us the proper abstraction to, uh, of files and directories and so on. And we're gonna get much more into that today. So we started by talking about devices um, and performance. So if you remember, one of the things that we talked about is how important it is to keep your overhead down. And so we talked about this particular graph of effective bandwidth. And it said that even though we have a gigabit per second link, um, our effective bandwidth can be a lot lower. And the reason is that there's this big overhead, uh, for instance, a millisecond, that uh, affects our bandwidth. So this, uh, this graph kind of showed you the size of a packet along the x-axis and how long it takes to send it. And um, you know this is going to be a linear graph uh, with respect to the size of the packet, but it has a, an intercept that's not zero. And so that means that the effective bandwidth, which is how much you actually get, how many bytes per unit time you actually get, is more like this red curve. And you have to get past a certain point before you can even get half of a gigabit per second. Okay. And so when we look at our file systems coming up, we're going to want to make sure that we somehow keep the effective bandwidth as low uh, or keep the effective bandwidth as close to the real bandwidth as possible. And that's going to mean we have to keep our overhead low. Okay. Um, the other thing we talked about uh, in some detail last time was uh, performance and queuing theory. And I just wanted to uh, remind you of what we came up with. <clears throat> so among other things, we talked about how there can be many examples of queues feeding into servers, okay? And, uh, and oftentimes you can take a much bigger system with lots of queues and lots of intermediate servers and boil it down to this, okay? And boiling it down to this, we basically were talking about a system in equilibrium, among other things. And so this queue is neither uh, growing or shrinking without bound, uh, probabilistically. We have an arrival rate that's uh, some lambda uh, per unit time, and we have a service rate, which is mu. And by the way, mu can be uh, also one over the uh, average service time of the server. All right, and so the different parameters we talked about are lambda is the uh, average or mean number of arriving customers per second. T sur is the average time to service a customer. Sometimes that's called uh, the mean or the M1 uh, moment. We have uh, C which is this uh, squared coefficient of variance, and that's the standard deviation squared over M1 squared. Uh, this is unitless. And what's amazing about that is that our result, um, C basically uh, tells us all we need to know. We don't know, need to know how complicated the overall probability distribution was. So this server is allowed to have an arbitrarily complicated service distribution, and we can compute the uh, the average service rate by taking one over that uh, average time. This arrival rate, however, is memoryless in our model. So we're keeping things very simple here. Um, computing from our parameters, so if we know the, the average time to serve or the average time to get your hamburger um, at McDonald's, then by one over that is mu, okay? Uh, the server utilization is lambda over mu or multiplying this out lambda times T sir. And the interesting thing we talked about is the fact that this server utilization can't be bigger than one. Can anybody remember why it can't be bigger than one? What happens if rho is greater than one? What happens if rho is greater than one? Q grows without bound. Yep, uh, that's a problem. Okay, so the parameters we might wish to compute. So if you notice here, these three red ones are enough uh, to compute the green ones and pretty much everything else. So if you have uh, pretty much three out of these five, then you can compute the others. And notice, by the way, that C is talking about the standard deviation of the service time of the server, since this is a general, potentially a general probability distribution. So parameters we might care about is how long are you in the queue? That's T sub Q. Or what's the length of the Q on average, okay? And using Little's law, which we talked about last time, that's lambda times TQ. And some results that matter here now are, for instance, if you have a memoryless arrival rate and a memoryless server rate, or an MM1Q, then um, the time in the Q turns out to be the service time times rho over one minus rho. And if you have a 
general uh, distribution, where it's not memoryless going out, then notice the difference between these two is very, it's very close. It's still the service time times this extra factor of one half one plus C times rho over one minus rho. And the interesting question um, that we sort of confronted last time was, uh, why is it that um, the service latency blows up? And the answer is, the simple answer is that um, all of these models come out with this rho over one minus rho factor. So that as rho goes to one, this thing blows up to infinity. And so really this uh, behavior that we're seeing here, um, potentially going to infinity if there's an infinite Q is uh, solely the fact of this rho over one minus rho. All right. So you should be able, I gave some examples at the end of the lecture last time. So um, I would say you might wanna uh, remember them. Um, this could be a useful thing for midterm three. Um, the, the important thing to keep in mind is uh, I would go through the last lecture to understand where these numbers, what these numbers mean, but uh, the most important sort of back of the envelope queuing theory results we've talked about in this class are these two, uh, the MM1Q and the MG1Q. And the one, by the way, at the end just means there's a single queue and a, or a single server, excuse me. So we could have multiple servers and then the, the uh, equations would be a little different, but uh, if we were gonna do that to you, we, we'd give you the equation. All right, any questions before I move on? So once you've got these equations, by the way, it's just a matter of plugging and playing. So you get some estimates of, you know, if this is disk service rates, you might have estimates of how often uh, requests come in from the user uh, processes to the kernel. This queue might be queuing in the kernel. Um, and this service rate has to do with the disk drive, uh, which we gave you a, uh, a way of computing how long it takes to do something with the disk. And so uh, once you know some of these parameters, then you could make an estimate, is my queue gonna blow up? Um, or you know, do I need another disk in order to get more service uh, rate here, okay? Good. So um, we also talked about uh, a couple of lectures ago, a few ways of hiding IO latency, which I wanted to just bring up because um, you know, as we start designing file systems, you'll be able to start seeing where we can put some of these uh, different options in here. So blocking interface, of course, is the one that you've learned from pretty much lecture number two or whatever, which says that I do a read and I tell, I say, I wanna read so many bytes. And what happens is the uh, system call doesn't return until we have that number of bytes or until there's an end of file. When we go to write, uh, I'd say, write these number of bytes and it won't return until they've all been written or if it does return, it'll at least tell us uh, how many bytes have been written, okay? And so that's a blocking interface. The other two I gave you uh, a few lectures ago were the non-blocking and the asynchronous. The non-blocking interface basically says, do what you can immediately and then come back and tell me, don't wait. So the non-blocking interface uh, may require you to process it in a loop, but you'll never be blocked waiting. The asynchronous interface is what I like to call the tell me later interface. This is an example where you, uh, the user code hands a buffer to the kernel and says, well, do, do my read of 100 bytes and put it in this buffer. And then it immediately returns from the kernel, but you get a signal later that says it's ready. Okay, and so those are, those are kind of two asynchronous options. And the reason they're interesting to bring up is pretty much in the kernel, um, the non-blocking and asynchronous interfaces are really what the devices provide. Okay, they don't provide blocking. That's something that we give to the processes and it's an abstraction, okay? So the asynchronous interface is exactly like a type of callback, yes. Okay, and, and uh, if you're interested, uh, you can often turn this on for file systems and other devices by using the ioctal interface on the file descriptor after you've opened it. So that's a good question, okay. So if you remember, we've had this kind of diagram almost from day one. We talked about in lecture four even, we talked about a bunch of different ways of accessing files like streams and file descriptors, um, et cetera. So that's the, the F open and versus open. And then we've talked a bunch about devices over the last couple of lectures. And so today we're gonna talk about what's in the middle. And what's in the middle is interesting because above we, we have this, uh, abstraction of bytes streams. Okay, streams of bytes 
where we can ask for 12 bytes or 13 bytes or whatever. Underneath, we know that there are blocks, okay? We talked about disks having sectors or uh, multiple sectors together giving you a block. And so that's not byte oriented, that's block oriented. So somehow in the middle, the file system has to provide uh, a matching between the blocks underneath and the streams above. And that's what the file system is gonna help us do. Okay, and of course the things you're all used to with files, like looking them up in directories, um, opening them, closing them, writing them, all of that stuff needs this thing in red here to work properly. And so that's what um, our next couple of lectures are about, okay? So how do we go from storage to file system? So up at the top level here, uh, we have variable size buffers and uh, the API and syscalls that we're using uh, are all about, give me this number of bytes and maybe we set the offset, give me this number of bytes at some offset or write these bytes at some offset. Uh, underneath is the file system, which is a block-based interface. And a typical uh, block that we might talk about is four kilobytes. Okay, that's a pretty common block size, which you should recognize from when we were talking about virtual memory as well. The devices underneath mo mostly map to these blocks, okay? So underneath we have uh, sectors, which are smaller than a block, but typically we put a bunch of sectors together on a track on a disk and we call that a block. And so the physical sector being the minimum uh, chunk of bytes that you could read or write could be either 512 bytes, that's pretty standard, or the really big drives that we have these days, four kilobytes, okay? And so um, that's the basic uh, chunk of, of bytes that you can read and write. And, and so uh, somehow again, we're gonna have to go from this variable size up top through the block interface to the actual physical interface of the disk drive. And one of the things we're not gonna talk about today, but next time is we wanna try to put some sort of caching in here or something to make this faster, okay? Cause we, you know, I've sort of joked at various times this term that pretty much everything in operating systems is a cache, okay? And so um, obviously there's gonna be a cache somewhere here, but we're gonna deal with structure first and then we'll cache it later. Um, and we also talked about SSDs or flash-based disk drives. So one of the things that's uh, different than just raw flash chips is when you put it into an SSD, this interface between uh, the operating system through the device driver and the device has a lot of similarities between a disk drive and an SSD. And in fact, there is a, a layer in there that makes that SSD look like spinning storage, except it doesn't have the seek time and the rotational time to slow you up. Okay, and um, if you notice, uh, the other thing that's very unique about the SSD, which I mentioned, and, I'll, and if we get to uh, something at the end of the lecture today, I'll show you again, is that this uh, SSD, the blocks are things that can never be overwritten, okay? You have to take an erased block and write to it. You can't take a block you've already written to and change the bytes. What you have to do is, if you're gonna change a physical block, what you really have to do is find a new physical block, copy everything over except for what you wanna change, and then the, the previous block gets garbage collected. And the way that the operating system doesn't have to deal with that is this translation layer. And so the, uh, the logical block numbers that the file system and the device driver think you're using are actually translated inside the SSD to the physical blocks on uh, of flash memory. And that translation layer in the firmware is responsible for making sure that things don't wear out uh, so that the, you're, you're not overusing some particular physical block by writing it, erasing it, writing it, erasing it over and over again. Instead, there's actually wear leveling firmware that makes sure that the SSD doesn't get overwritten. Okay, And so then that's the other thing that needs to be kept track of is a bunch of erasures uh, that happens. So you actually have to work to make sure that you erase a bunch of blocks that aren't in use anymore so that you can um, have them ready to go, all right? And so that's a fundamentally different aspect from hard disk drives where you can actually overwrite the sectors. Okay, but the interface is pretty much the same. It's uh, dealing with four kilobyte blocks that are re read and written. It's just the underlying physical things a little different, but we're popping up, okay? so. Um, now there's a good question here. Uh, so if you overwrite a block with zeros to uh, erase the file, is there any way to tell the SSD to actually erase it? Um, that's a really good question. And 
the answer is not always yes. <laughs> so um, modern, uh, there are some SSDs that have the ability to encrypt things natively on, on the, the drive itself, and then you have a little more control over it. But just because you write a bunch of zeros into block uh, number 536 uh, absolutely means nothing in terms of what actually happened to the data underneath because you're writing to a completely new block. Okay, that's a good question. Now, uh, oops, where am I here? Okay, so how do we build a file system? So if, what's a file system? A file system is a layer of the operating system that transforms uh, the block interface of the disks into files or directories or things you're used to. And so the, this is a classic operating system situation that you're very familiar with, hopefully by now. Been doing this all term where you take limited hardware interface, which is an array of blocks, and you provide a new virtualized interface that's much more convenient and provides, in this instance, a whole bunch of features like naming, so we can file fi uh, find files by name, not necessarily block numbers. Um, we can order, organize the file names inside of directories. Uh, we can map files into blocks and figure out which blocks belong to which files. Um, and then, of course, things like protection and reliability are important things as well, which is we want to enforce the uh, access restrictions to prevent uh, you know, unauthorized parties from reading and writing files that they're not supposed to, and reliability. We're going to want to put some level of redundancy into the system to uh, make sure we don't lose our data, even though we have crashes and hardware failures, et cetera. Okay, so um, this level of abstracting is really what the file system's about, and I'm going to give you uh, another a number of, uh, of uh, actual case studies to show you how people have done that um, in several file systems that are currently actively used. So um, again, what we just said a little bit ago, but I wanted to repeat this, is the user's view of files is that they're durable data structures that um, you put the data in and it doesn't go away. The system's view, of course, is that it's a collection of bytes. That's the Unix view at the system call level. And it doesn't really matter what data structures you put in the disk. So the interesting thing is the user only really knows how to interpret the bytes Unix makes no uh, restrictions on how you structure those bytes. It's entirely up to you. So from the system's point of view, it's a, a bag of bytes. And then when you get underneath the uh, system call interface and into the actual uh, file system and so on and caching system, the system's view then underneath there becomes a collection of blocks because the block is the logical transfer unit. Okay, and the block size typically is bigger than the sector size, where the sector is the physical transfer unit. That's the minimum transfer unit on the disk. We bring it into blocks because uh, typically, like the sector is 512 bytes, that's just too small. And so we turn a bunch of sectors into a block, and that's what we read and write off of the disk. All right. So you can kind of look at this you know, here's the user, they have a file full of bytes. They talk to the file system, the file system talks to the disk. And when all is said and done, the user thinks they have files that are a bunch of bytes. Okay, so that's our goal. So just to hammer this home a little bit, what happens if the user says, give me bytes two through 12? Well, what happens is the file system has to fetch the block that has those bytes in it. So that block uh, might be on disk. Okay, in which case it's got to pull it into a cache and then since that's probably 400, or excuse me, since that's probably four kilobytes, it has to figure out where bytes two through 12 are, package them up into the user's buffer and return it, okay? Now it's quite possible that if this is the second time we asked for, um, you know, when we go to ask for bytes 13 through 36, maybe that block's already in the cache and we don't actually have to go out to the disk. Now, it's an interesting question here. What if you have multiple files with different permissions in the same block? So the answer is that doesn't really happen. That's a, that's a bit of a failure of the file system because right now the file system uh, provides a one-to-one -one mapping between files and underlying blocks. Um, so the, uh, the permissions are on the files, not on the individual blocks because the blocks are assembled into files and the metadata for permissions are actually in the inode, which I'll show you in a little bit. Okay, good question though. So what happens if we go to write bytes two through 12? This is a little trickier and I wanted to make sure this is clear. So you have to actually, since you can only deal with blocks at the disk level, you have to pull your block in 
overwrite bytes through two through 12 and then write it back out before you can modify bytes two through 12. You can't actually go in here and only write a few bytes on the disk, okay? It's just not, it's not possible. So we have to make sure that we, um, you can start to see why having blocks stored in RAM, at least temporarily, is gonna be really important because at minimum, we're gonna need to bring a block in, overwrite a couple of bytes and store it back out. Um, we're gonna do much better than that when we get to the block cache, but we're not there yet. And of course, everything inside the file system itself is in terms of whole size blocks. The actual IO happens in blocks um, and any reading and writing of something smaller has to happen uh, across this file file system interface. Okay. Now, so how do we manage a disk? So uh, we're going to, in the next, um, I don't know, I'm going to say half an hour or whatever, we're going to talk specifically about disk drives, but we're going to um, generalize some ideas about how do we manage a disk. So basic entities on a disk uh, that we're going to want to have is we're going to want to be able to have files and directories. Okay, so a file is a user visible group of blocks arranged in some logical space, or a, what I like to say is a bag of, of bytes. A directory is a user usable, uh, excuse me, a directory is a user visible index mapping names to files. So um, we're going to have to figure out how to do that so that we can turn a file name into something that's a file. Okay, and so that's going to be part of what the, the uh, file system does. So the disk is a linear array of sectors. And so how do you identify those sectors? Well, there's a couple of ways to do that. One, which was kind of in the original disks uh, before they got too big, uh, a sector was really just a vector of which cylinder surface and sector it's on. So if you remember a cylinder is all of the tracks that are um, on top of each other, and it really represents the positioning of the, the head assembly. The surface is which one, top or bottom, and which platter. So that's which surface you're on, and then which sector. So the sector itself is a, a three uh, tuple here, defining where that thing is on the disk. It's not really used anymore. Um, and uh, one of the reasons was things got so big that the BIOSes weren't able to keep up with it. Um, and in this instance, the OS slash BIOS, which is lower level than the OS, had to deal with bad sectors, and the disk just got so big that it wasn't working anymore. So at some point, um, we switched over to the logical block addressing, where every sector has an integer address starting from one and working its way up to the size of the disk, and the controller does a mapping from the uh, integer number to physical position and shields the OS from the structure of the disk. Okay. So the SSDs don't actually expose the cylinder surface sector interface either. So that was a good question in the chat. Pretty much this logical block addressing is uh, what had pretty much taken hold before SSDs were really very popular. So pretty much um, the SSDs are giving you this LBA level of an interface, which is a, a logical ordering of blocks from one to n. Okay. Um, now, uh, this has some consequences. So if you recall from last lecture, we talked a bit about elevator algorithms to uh, basically take a bunch of requests and rearrange them so that the disk would do a nice clean sweep rather than randomly going all over the place. Uh, once you have logical block addresses, now you're only really guessing that somehow blocks that are next to each other are close to each other and in the same track. You don't quite have the same level of information that you had before but operating systems still try to do a job of uh, optimizing for locality. It's just not quite as precise as it was back in the days with the physical positioning that was uh, cylinder surface sector. Now, what does a file system really need to, to work? Well, it has to track which disk blocks are free, okay? And in the case of the SSD, it's also tracking which blocks, and I say that in quotes, are free, it's just, it knows the logical block number. It doesn't really know what physical part of the flash chips are storing that, but it has a notion that there are these blocks and some of them are free and some aren't. So it's still doing that same idea, which is tracking the disk blocks. And you need to know that so that you can know when to, where to put your uh, newly written data. Um, you need to track which blocks contain data for which files. Okay, so that, you know, when you go to open a file and you start reading from block from uh, bytes two through 12, first thing you got to figure out is where is 
the first block of that file, well, it's on disk somewhere. How do you know which one it is? Well, that's the file systems problem, right? It also has to track files in a directory so that you can look them up by file name. Okay, again, that's the file systems problem. And where do you put all this? Well, since we need to be able to shut the whole system down and come back and our data is still there, all of this stuff has to be on disk somewhere. So not only does the disk hold all the data, but it's got to hold all this metadata in a way that we can um, start from scratch once we turn the file system, once we turn the operating system on and reboot the machine. So we are, you know, you could say there's a little bit of a recursive issue here, but somehow the information that's tracking the files, we need to put that information also on disk, possibly in a file. And so um, if, you, if you are tracking that, you can see that perhaps there's something about standard positions for the root file system or something like that. And we'll talk about that in a moment. All right, questions? Okay, you guys with me so far? Now, what are, what's the story with putting data structures on, diff, on disk? It's a bit different than data structures in memory. So in memory, I could have pointers to things that are arbitrary byte pointers, and I can do linked lists and stuff. The ideas there are the same, except that the, the data structures have to be made out of these uh, minimum quanta of blocks. And that kind of changes what data structures we use a little bit. And it turns out once we start worrying about performance, we're also going to be very careful about which blocks are next to each other on the disk, because we're going to want to try to keep them next to each other in the file as well, because that'll give us better performance. So um, the other thing is we, we can only access one block at a time. So you can't really efficiently read write a single word. We already said that. You have to read or write the whole block containing it. Um, and ideally, you want sequential access patterns where you sort of write a bunch of stuff along a track on the disk. All right. And you can imagine that with SSDs, as I've told you, every time you go to write something, you actually have to allocate a, a brand new um, erased block under the covers and use that to do your um, overwriting. And so part of this has to do with um, being careful about how much erasing and reallocating you're asking the flash translation unit to do. And so flash aware file systems are a little bit careful about when they even decide to read and write blocks. Okay, And if we get to that at the very end of the lecture, I'll tell you a little bit about um, F2FS, which is one of the flash file systems that's in use these days. So. Now, the other things to start thinking about is when you go to write something on disk, it takes a little while to get there. And, um, and furthermore, if we have these data structures that are on disk and they have to look a certain way, there's some consistency in those data structures. Ideally, when we go to shut the whole system down and turn it off, the disk is a completely meaningful, consistent state. Um, and I don't know if any of you have ever lost data because your machine crashed at the wrong time. I'm sure um, there are many of you. <laughs> uh, then you'll know that the, uh, the file system doesn't always shut down in a clean state. And so although we won't get to this this time, next time we're definitely going to start talking a bit about journaling and some of the other techniques for making sure that data is never lost, even when uh, we have sudden shutdowns. Okay, so that's going to be important. Okay, now let's meet. I don't have a lot of administrivia. We're almost, almost, almost done grading. So um, I'm, I'm, I, I feel almost like I'm talking about counting votes in the current election. Uh, we, we, we're, we're getting there. It's going to happen. Um, and uh, so we'll, you'll know as soon as we're ready. Um, the other thing is, uh, and I think everybody's probably done this, but make sure to fill out the post midterm survey. Uh, let us know what we're doing, how we can improve. Um, and uh, the other thing, which I'm not sure we put into the survey, but you're welcome to forward to me individually, is uh, if there are any particular topics you'd like to talk about in the last lecture or two, let me know. Um, and I'll, you know, I might throw together uh, an interesting lecture with topics that were requested by people. So um, feel free to take advantage of that. I've actually had people ask me about things like quantum computing, which is not really 162, but 
Um, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to uh, talk about things as long as I can say something meaningful about it. Um, yes, uh, I would say that the results of the midterm grading just uh, is going to be far less contentious than the results of the election. We shall see. Um, but uh, as you have seen, for those of you that are watching the counting uh, of the election, uh, slow and steady is the name of the game. So um, this is all about taking a breath, which is good. Breathing is good, by the way, too. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is if you have any group issues going on, whatever, make sure your TA knows about this. Uh, make sure you reflect those issues in your group evaluations. Give us some good feedback because we will take all of these things into account. Uh, at the end of the term. So I don't think there's anything else to say about administrivia. Um, I, uh, I think that's pretty much what I had to say. So I think we're good to go, unless anybody had any questions. The term is kind of winding down. We're down to like the last maybe six or seven lectures. Sometimes I do my special lecture into RRR week. We might do that, but uh, we're, we're getting down to the last few, so. Okay. No more questions. So let's talk about designing file systems. So what are some critical factors? Well, clearly performance, okay? And, and hard disks are a good example of trying to get performance out of a less than ideal device from a performance standpoint, because if you have to seek and then you have to wait for rotational latency and then you can read, that's going to take a long time. And I showed you several examples uh, a couple of lectures ago, which showed you the difference between if you have to seek, your total bandwidth goes way down versus if you don't have to seek, your bandwidth is much higher. And so we're going to want to do a good job of the same thing in our file system. So that's going to be important, OK? And this, by the way, is hard to get right. Um, what's great about this, by the way, just to put one more uh, point on this is when you get to SSDs, then randomly writing things in your logical block space is or reading from it is no longer a performance issue because every block pretty much it, it takes about the same amount of time to read. And so some of the optimizations for disk drives are less required in SSDs. Okay. Now, other things that really just feed into the Unix view of the world is that um, we always have to do open before reading and writing. So, you know, you just think about that. You do an open system call and then you get the file descriptor back and then you can do reads and writes. What's good about that model is you can perform protection checks on open, figure out where the file resources are in advance. And then from that point on, you're really just accessing the blocks directly. And this fits in a little bit earlier. There was a question about um, what if, you know, you had different permissions on the block from different people, they just don't do that in these typical file systems, okay? All of the permissions are attached to the file as a whole. Now, uh, in the last couple of lectures, we're going to expand quite a bit where we start talking about file systems that might actually span the globe. <coughs> in that, <coughs> excuse me, in that instance, <coughs> you can't necessarily trust that uh, the permissions that have been checked on open are going to be kept when you're talking to uh, data that's being stored somewhere in Antarctica or wherever it happens to be. And so we might have to adapt slightly different behavior once we get there. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the other thing is kind of a, a side effect of Unix, which is the size of the file is determined as you use it. You think about this a second. You open a file, and then typically you write bytes to it and then you close the file. And so the file system really has no idea how big your file is gonna be until you actually close it. Or if you open it, you write some stuff, you close it, and then you go back later and you open it, you append some stuff and close it. Now the file is also growing incrementally. <clears throat> and so to any extent that the file system is gonna optimize the placement of your bytes to try to make everything fast, runs into this unfortunate problem here that, um, it doesn't really know how big your file is, OK? Um, the other thing we're going to need to do is organize everything into directories, and so we have to figure out what data structure that is, OK? And then finally, we're going to need to very carefully allocate in free blocks so that our access remains efficient, and we can hopefully minimize seeks, as I started out here, maximizing sequential access. Those two things are going to be uh, very important for us in our design. 
Okay. So what are some important components of a file system? So we have uh, your file path, which is the name. You go somehow into a directory structure. That's going to give us something we call an I number, which is really a pointer into uh, an inode array. We'll get to that in a little bit. And what is an inode? An inode is basically a fi um, file header structure that points at which blocks belong in the file. So think of this as like an index or like uh, a big array that sort of translates from a position in that array to which data block is in the file. And this file header structure is the thing that's going to get modified as I uh, read and write the file. So I write the file, make it bigger. I'm going to be adding entries here. When I allocate a brand new file by opening it with create, what I'm doing is I'm allocating a brand new inode just for that new file. Now, um, the interesting question here also that's in the chat here is does error checking usually depend on the block device or the file system? Um, so uh, there's a lot of layers of error checking. We'll talk about those next lecture, but just as a simple thing to point out, the data um, sectors themselves have a whole bunch of Reed Solomon bits on them that uh, so you actually write more bits than you um, think you're writing. And that allows it to handle a, a lot of read errors just off the disk. And then um, once we want to really if, deal with the fact that maybe a whole disk could uh, die, then we start doing stuff like RAID and so on, which we'll talk more. So mostly the error checking at one level is on the disk itself. And then at another level, we use redundancy by writing to multiple disk drives in order to deal with a drive failure. Um, the I here is just for inode. So inode uh, is uh, index is what the I stands for. And so it's an index node. And this is the index node number, I number, or whatever. But all right. Now, if you remember, by the way, way back when we talked about the abstract representation of a process, it's got some thread registered, it's got some address space, and so on. The file descriptor table is in the uh, process uh, descriptor, okay? And that basically transforms numbers to open file descriptions, if you remember. And the way we talked about it, you can go back and look in, I don't know, lecture six or something, was we said, well, this file description keeps track of uh, what the file name is and what position you're currently at in that file name so that when you're reading and writing, it can kind of pick up where you left off. In reality, what's actually being stored in the open file description is the current I number. Because uh, if you remember, we open the file first, and that's where we trace the name all the way through the directory structure. And then eventually, we find the I number, which points at the actual file. And that I number now is what we use when we read and write. So you can actually get into a situation where um, you open a file, and then it gets moved. And you can continue to read and write it, even though it's moved it somewhere other than what your uh, name pointed at. And that's because the open has uh, held on to the I number, not the name. Okay. All right. Now, so we take the file name uh, and we look that up in a directory structure, which gives us the file number. Um, so open performs the name resolution. We're going to have to figure out how to do that translating path name into a file number. Uh, read and write operates on the file number. Um, and you use the file number as an index to locate the block. And so the file number goes into the index structure to the storage block, and that's on disk. And so really, you're going to figure out, well, I'm at offset. Um, suppose I was to go to uh, 5K, uh, 5,000 in some file. Well, um, that's going to be in the second block, because the first block is 0 to 4095. Um, and then the second block is going to handle the next set of bytes. And so I'm going to look that up in my index structure and find out where the second block is or block number one. That's going to point at the disk somewhere. And so I know that when I go to access byte 5000, I'll know which block it is. So we're going to have to look at both how the directory works and how this inode structure works to help us find uh, which block is of interest to us. OK. So there's several components which we're going to talk about in the next few slides. One is what's a directory look like and what is it exactly. Another is what's that actual index structure. Um, a third is we're going to talk about storage blocks and the free space map. 
a lot of these choices in here of these four pieces at least are things that vary depending on what file system you're using. Okay. So let's uh, first ask our question, how do we get the file number? Well, you look it up in the directory. So a directory is really a file in most file systems containing file name, file number mappings. Okay, and so basically a directory is just a file and you go in that directory and you find the file name you're looking for and that gives you the file number. And as a result of that, then you can know, uh, get the index structure and know where to look on disk. The file number could be a file or another directory could point out a file or another directory. So really the way you go through slash a slash b slash c slash d is you find slash and in slash you look up a which points to to uh to directory a and then in directory a you look up b and so on and so it's a chain of lookups through multiple different directory structures okay and so each file name file number mapping is actually called a directory entry okay um now the processes are never allowed to read the raw bytes of a directory so if you try to open a directory um, it doesn't really work properly, okay? And so the, I, what I said earlier is that by and large, Unix doesn't care about the format of the data in files. The one point at which that's not true is the directory format, because the directory format, something that's directly interpreted, interpreted, boy, I'm losing it today, sorry, directly interpreted by the uh, operating system, okay? Um, this is from watching uh, vote counts for too long. I think I'm... Um, going slowly crazy. But anyway, so um, instead there's actually something called a reader uh, system call. You can look it up, do a man on it, which iterates over this map without revealing the bytes, okay? Um, so why shouldn't uh, we let the OS read and write the bytes of the directory? Well, because they might screw it up, okay? And so pretty much the um, read directory, write directory, create, all of that stuff are operations that cause changes to directories indirectly, okay? So um, just keep that in mind. But by and large, except for the format inside a directory, a directory is just a file. And so keep that in mind because we're gonna be building files using our file system and we're just gonna use those files to, hold, to store data or to store directory mappings. And so um, the basic bag of bits that and bytes that we end up using for our directory is something we're going to get out of our file mapping okay so here's directories just in case you know this is what you get on a mac os just the idea of these folders are something that kind of came up graphically um, 20 years ago or whatever but basically what we're seeing here is this top level directory has a directory in it called static. Um, and that static directory has in it a bunch of other things which have, for instance, homework. And inside of that might have homework zero.pdf. This is a set of directories that we search until we eventually get to the actual file. Okay. So the directory abstraction, just to say a little bit more. So directories, that's what these blue things are here, are specialized files contents uh, with lists of pairs of file name and file number. So in the slash USR directory, um, what you see here is a pointer to uh, lib 4.3 is actually a pointer to this directory. A pointer to lib is this one. Inside the lib 4.3 directory, there's a pointer to foo, which is this actual file, okay? So these pointers are uh, really just links, uh, their I numbers, which uh, point at the inode structure that describes this file, which happens to be a directory in this instance, okay? So the system calls to create directories, open, create, read directory, traverse the structure. So notice that open and create and things like that actually add things to directories. You can do read dir to uh, read your way through all the entries. Um, there's make directory and remove directory. You guys know about that. That would be the way that, for instance, the original lib 4.3 got put into slash USR. Um, and then there's link and unlink, which allow you to, to mess with these actual links, okay? And there's a bunch of libc support for iterating through uh, the directory. So you should take a look, but there's like open directory. And then once you get back to a directory star, then you can read the next entry from it and you can process it in various ways. So there's a whole series of system calls that have been made just to traverse this directory tree 
which is something that you end up doing um, almost uh, for sure if you ever have, uh, if you ever write an application that's got to talk to files. Okay. So what's the directory structure? Well, let's take a look here. I'm just going to hammer this home. I said this earlier. So how many disk accesses does it take to resolve, say, slash my book, slash my, slash book, slash count? Well, you first have to read in the file header for the root directory. So that's the slash directory. And that turns out is at a fixed spot on the disk somewhere. So one of the things that a file system gives you is um, the place of the root inode for the root directory. Okay. Um, and then you read in the first data block for the root. So remember the root is just a file. So I read in the first block of the file and I start traversing the directory. And eventually, hopefully I find, uh, you know, it's a table of name index pairs and I search it linearly to find the word my or the name my in it. And uh, you can search it linearly in most standard unices, okay? Um, and so, uh, that linear search becomes a really big problem if you have a directory with lots of entries in it, which sometimes automatically generated directories are that way. Now, the question here is if the root is at a fixed place, um, does that mean it has a maximum size? So the answer is no. The thing that's at a fixed place is the inode index structure, uh, not the file blocks. And the there is a maximum file size in a typical, um, file system, but that's much larger than you'd ever fill up with a directory. Okay, so your the fixed thing is the inode, not the data. And you'll see that a little bit more as we get there. So then you read in the header for my, so yeah, that's another reference. And then you look through my to find book, and then you read in the header for book, and header, by the way, is the same as inode. And then you read in the data block for book, you search for count, read the file header for count. And at that point, I now have the, um, I now have the inode for the actual file and that can go in, uh, you know, that's basically cached for all my reads and writes at that point on, okay, in the description. Now, um, and a file descriptor points at the description, which uh, holds on to the, the header for count, all right? Now, the question here might, uh, is a good one, which is why not just store the full path in a big hash table? So the answer is um, there are some file systems that do that. Uh, where, so what you're basically saying is you take my, slash my slash book slash count and you, um, you map that to the inode. Um, you could do that, uh, except that then that makes management a little harder because um, you know, typically you uh, link a new directory. And if you think about it, you make a directory and then you add things to it. And so the directory structure itself is um, typically organized the way we're talking about. Um, but it's not impossible to organize it as a hash table, okay? But let's let's organize it this way for now, all right? Because this is this is closer to what um, most file systems do. It's easy. It's simpler than a huge system-wide hash table because you're not storing, you're not having to worry where to store the hash table. I don't know if that answers that question or not. Okay, but it's not it's not a uh, out of the question, and there are some file systems that have chosen to do it that way. So the other thing that we mentioned kind of way back when was current working directory, which is uh, basically a per address based pointer to a directory that's used for resolving file names. And this is an example in which the current working directory could be slash my slash book. And in that case, um, you could actually cache the inode structure for slash my slash book in the kernel. And thereby when you go to get to count, it's much faster if your current working directory is slash my slash book, okay? And in keeping with the notion that everything's a cache, in fact, what we cache under some circumstance, actually what the operating systems do cache is they cache names. And so slash my slash book is actually kept, the, uh, the book pointer is actually kept in an internal name cache, uh, which gets a little pretty close to um, the question that was just asked about keeping a path in a big hash table. So, um, so if you think about the hash table as a cache rather than as the, um, the ground truth on the directory, then that kind of works the way I think you were thinking there. Now, um, so our in-memory data structures, uh, here's the, the per process uh, file table, which takes a file descriptor um, number and that looks up the, in the file description and that file description, which is typically system-wide, 
uh, you load the inode into it and it points at data blocks, okay? And so once we pull the inode into memory, then we can read the various blocks in the file pretty quickly and we don't care where it's, the actual file name is, okay? So the open system, system call basically finds the inode on the disk from the path name by traversing all the directories, creates an in-memory inode, and from that point on, then uh, access to the file is fast and it's independent of how long the path name is. One entry in this table, no matter how many instances of the file are open. So if this file is open by many people, there's only one description here with many different uh, file descriptors pointing at it. Okay, now if you rename or move a file, does it create a new inode or modify the existing inode? Neither. What it does when you move the file is it just changes uh, the directory structure, it's the same inode, it's unchanged. So the inode is the file in some sense, and you can move it around, but all you're doing there is you're changing who's pointing at that inode. Okay, I hope that answered that question. And in fact, if the same file is in several different directories, then you can have several different directories point at the inode and uh, it just all works out, okay? And so this is, Part of why the inode is the thing that we want to store our permission bits on as well. Okay. Now, of course, the first file system we're going to talk about is the FAT file system, and it violates a whole bunch of these things, but it's probably the most common file system in use today. So we're going to start with that one. Um, so read and write system calls look up in memory inode using the file handle. Um, and so once we've opened, then everything is fast. Okay. So the last thing I want to do before we look at some uh, case studies is Let's see if we can understand what our characteristics of our files are uh, in order to help us design our file system. And so there have been many things uh, studied over the years. Here's one uh, that was published in FAST, which is a file system con conference 2007. And one of the observations was really that most files are small. So what they did was they tracked the size of files um, in the file system over the years and starting in 2000 and five years worth of data. And what you see here is that um, most of the files are in this um, small range here, even though there are some long tails, okay? And so most files are small, says that I need to optimize for small, that's like 2K or less files, but most of the bytes are in the large files, okay? so. If you look at how many bytes are uh, total in the file uh, versus how much of the space it uses up, what you find is that most of the space on the file system is used by the large files, even though there's a lot of small files. So there's a lot of small files, but most of the bytes are in the large files. So what these two pieces of data show you, and the trends of course are that files keep getting bigger and so on, but what these two pieces of data show you is that one, we need to be extremely efficient with small files. And two, we need to support large files still um, because those are very important. So we can't really focus on just small files or large files. We wanna have something that does both well, okay? And we're gonna keep that in mind because that's gonna tell us a little bit about why various operating systems designed their file systems the way they did. So the first one I wanna show you is the uh, most common file system in the world. I would say this is the one that you have on your uh, cameras that you, when you uh, take uh, and plug in a USB stick, it's a fat file system and so on. This was the original MS-DOS file system and it has found its way through many iterations and sizes to uh, ridiculously large flash drives. Okay, and so this is a good one to know because it kind of lets us see the simplest form of how we could build a file system. And so the simple idea, FAT stands for file allocation table. And what a file allocation table is, is it's just a big table of integers, okay? And you could think of it as sitting next to the disk blocks, okay? And that big um, table of integers is one-to-one -one correspondence with all the data blocks. So there is a uh, entry zero in the FAT corresponds to uh, disk block zero, entry one corresponds to disk block one, and so on. So you could almost think of the FAT file system as being a one integer worth of metadata per block, okay? And this FAT uh, directory or this FAT index is basically gonna be stored on the disk in a few disk blocks. 
uh, and it's actually replicated for uh, reliability reasons. And let's see how we can build a file system out of it. Okay, so assume for now that we have a way to translate a path, so that means a full name, into a file number. Okay, so um, let's assume we have a directory and I'll show you how that works in a moment. Well then, uh, disk storage is just a bunch of disk blocks. So, so what's a file? Well, a file is a bunch of disk blocks. How do you figure out which disk blocks they are? Well, um, we're gonna somehow link them together in a, in a linear order so that we've got a file out of them. And you could think that each block holds uh, file data. Okay, so it's, you could think of it, it's block number X of the file, or block B of the file offset X gives you, if we have say 4K byte blocks, gives you um, which of the 4K byte uh, bytes we're interested in, okay? And there'll be N blocks. And so if we put a bunch of blocks together, block zero will be some disk block, then there'll be block one, block two, and then we can figure out uh, which block we need and then inside it, which index we need to get the byte we want, okay? So for instance, suppose that we're talking about a file and I'm gonna call it file 31, block zero, file 31, block one, file 31 block two. So what I've just assumed here is that somehow our, um, our files are numbered and each file has a set of blocks, 0, 1, 2. And notice that they're spread potentially all over the disk. Okay, so this is a potentially big problem with the FAT file system. And so suppose now, uh, so what are B? So B is the block number and X is the offset. Okay, and so, so in this block here, if I were interested, suppose I were interested in getting byte five of the file, I would know that that's block zero because the blocks are say 4K in size. So it'd be block zero byte five. And so that would mean I'd go to this and I'd go to block zero and I'd find the fifth block in that and that would give me the byte that I wanted. Okay, does that help? So B is a file number, or is a block number here, okay? Now, let's suppose we wanna read from uh, file 31 uh, block two, some offset X, what do we do? Well, we have to index and find block two, which is down here. So how do we know what block two is of file 31? Well, FAT does this extremely simply, okay? All it does is we start with entry 31 is the file number. And so that means that the file number corresponds directly to whatever block, this is block 31, uh, represents block zero of the disk. Okay, so the 31st disk block is block zero of file 31. Okay, and then what does the FAT do? The FAT is a set of pointers that say, well, from block 31 or from uh, this potentially uh, spot in the FAT file system, the next block is what this link points to. So this 31 is gonna have a 32 in it because block 32 uh, in the disk is the next block of the file. And then down here, I don't know what block number this is, doesn't really matter, is block three of the file. And so basically I can walk through the blocks of the file by starting at the, the head block, which is the file number, and then just following the pointers. And that gives me block zero, block one, block two. Okay, and so the way I read the block from the disk is I wanted block two, do uh, two hops. And then I pull the whole block in, and at that point, now I can read block, uh, byte X out of that block and hand it back to the user. Okay. Questions. Now, if you read in the literature, what you'll find is there's many versions of the FAT file system. There was one that was 12 bits, one that was 16 bits, one that's 32 bits. Okay. That talks about the size of the integer in each one of these slots which has to do with disk block, the number of disk blocks on the disk. So you could imagine that FAT32 has many more, much larger disks it can handle than the original FAT12. Now, a very interesting question here that's in the chat is, what if you want file 32? The answer is there is no file 32 because file 32 would put you in the middle of file 31, okay? So not every file number corresponds to the beginning of a file. Okay, so let me say that again. So file 32 isn't a file, okay? File 31 is a file, block 32, it turns out is the second block of that file. Now, how do I know that? Well, I have to keep track of where my, my files start. And that's where the directory is gonna come into play. If I thought 
32 was a file and I popped in there, what I'm going to find is that file is going to look funny because it's going to be missing the first block. And if this is, say, a video and there's a certain encoding in it, I'm going to not be able to properly encode it because I'm jumping into the middle of that file. OK? So you can start to see the ways in which a FAT file system can get really screwed up. Like if I lose track of where all the file numbers in are, then it's going to be very hard to figure out uh, where the starts of all the files are. Now, there are recovery programs that will go through and try to figure out that, oh, look, here's this block, this block, and this block. And they look like they're block 0, 1, and 2 of a video file. Therefore, I'm going to call this a file, and I'm going to generate a new FAT for you that will let you read it as a file. But it's a very error-prone process. Okay. Now, um, how do we, let's look at this. So the file is a collection of disk blocks. The FAT is a linked list one-to-one -one with the blocks. Okay. The file number is uh, the index of the root of the block list for the file. Um, the question that's uh, an interesting one is, do they always go down? No. In fact, that's going to depend a lot on uh, if you read some files and you write some files and you delete some files and you read some files and you write some files and you delete some files and you iterate days, months, years. Uh, it's going to matter what blocks are free, and so you could you could link all over the place. So there is no locality in the FAT file system, especially after you've used it for a while. So that in fact the disk head is going to be going all over the place as you try to read linearly through a file. So you can already see this has got a problem here. Okay, why is this used in cameras USBs? Well, it's uh, it was the lowest common denominator. They wanted something that could work in uh, the original. MS-DOS slash Windows boxes and so on. And so pretty much it just historical reasons, FAT is the thing used. OK. Um, so I, that may be an unsatisfying answer, but that's the reason. Um, so the offset and the file is a block number and an offset within the block. You follow the list to get the block number. Unused blocks are marked free. So what does that mean? That means the FAT uh, has a special entry that isn't a link to another FAT entry that just says, I'm free. OK, and so when you need a new block, you can scan through the FAT uh, to find ones that are marked as free, and those are ones that you can use. OK, and so let me give you an example here. So um, suppose that I want to, uh, let's see, I guess I had a duplicate here. OK, suppose that I wanted to. Um, do a write, OK? So actually, before I do that, I want to show you something else here. So let's take a look at two files, OK? So here's an example with two files, file 31 and file uh, whatever file number two is. I have no idea what that number is. doesn't really matter. But it's got two blocks in it. File 31's got three blocks. Um, and notice that I've essentially written here um, another block into file 31. And so you can kind of see how these pointers can get all scrambled. Um, now, the question might be, where is this uh, fat stored? Well, it's stored on disk, OK, at the beginning. Um, and uh, there's a special entry here that marks things as free. Um, and uh, the question might be, what's the quickest way to format? Well, you could mark all the uh, fat entries as free. That's a quick format, so-called. And in that case, it doesn't really delete the data. What it does is it removes all the indexes. And so uh, if you do a quick format, uh, and you do you know, a directory, you do a list in the directory, it's really a dir, dir in, in Windows or whatever, uh, you'll think that things are gone. But in fact, all the data is underlying because all you've done is erased all the indexes. And somebody with a file recovery program might be able to still look at it. OK? So um, one of the good things about FAT is that it's simple. Uh, you can basically implement it in device firmware. And um, so that's one of the reasons that it's also used. Uh, in cameras and so on, because it's really simple to implement and doesn't require a lot of work. Okay, is the free list kept as a linked list? Uh, technically, the free list in the FAT uh, spec is really just zero entries here. Um, if you wanted to have a linked list, uh, you could do that in memory as a way of avoiding having to scan all the way through. Um, and uh, sometimes, if you have enough memory, what uh, most devices will do is they'll just load the whole fat into memory so it's much quicker to go through. Okay. Um, 
But technically speaking, if you took something and removed uh, the USB key and you'd look at the fat, things are indicated as free by being zero. Okay, so let's look at directories for a moment here. So a directory in FAT is a file containing a file name, file number mappings, okay? And so here's a, an example where um, we might have the name music and it has a pointer uh, in it to the file number for that uh, music directory. Notice that there's typically the dot, which is the pointing to this guy, and then the dot dot, which is pointing to the parent. Um, we link these directory entries together why are they linked together? Well, just because in the FAT, things are all linked, right? So this is a, the first very clear in, instance, hopefully for you guys, of a directory is just a file that's got special formatting, okay? Um, now, uh, the interesting question that was on this is what if the sector of the root directory fails, then you potentially lose your data. Now, the FAT, there's actually two copies of it, so you have a couple of chances to, to not lose it. Um, but if you really lose the fat, then you've just lost all of the indexes and potentially have no idea what files are linked together. So free space for new or deleted entries is kept. So when you delete something in a directory, you just link over it and there's free space in that directory. Um, in the fat, the file attributes are kept in the directory, which means unlike what I was saying earlier, um, that uh, we're not able to um, put permissions on the file itself, but rather on the directory. So that's not quite the way we wanted it. So what distinguishes directory files from normal files? Uh, you can get to them by starting at the root directory. Okay. So um, all of this makes sure it depends a lot on the actual format of the, the metadata not getting screwed up. And so any of you who have ever lost, I once lost a whole bunch of pictures in a camera uh, because a, a couple of blocks failed in the wrong way and it's very hard to get them back. So uh, the FAT file system is very fragile as you can see, but again, it's used uh, a lot in uh, very large USB keys. Okay. And uh, it's a linked list of entries. You have to linearly search through and so on. So where do you find the root directory? Just to circle back on that, it's at a well-defined place on disk. In the case of FAT, this is block 32, uh, or excuse me, block two. There are no block zero or one. Don't ask me why, that's just what they did. So pretty much the very first block on the disk is the primary FAT. Uh, and uh, that's where you start your lookup, okay? Good. So discussion, suppose you start with a file number. Time, how, much, how long does it take to find a block? Well, it's linear, right? You have to linearly search your way through. What's the block layout for a file? Well, the, the layout for a file is accidentally whatever happens to be uh, used as you're writing and wherever the free blocks are. Uh, what about sequential access? Well, sequential access is slow because you have to work your way through uh, pointer, 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 pointer. So, um, you know, I guess if going from pointer to pointer is not too bad, then your sequential access is not too bad. Random access is pretty bad, right? So if I wanted to get to block three from, blo from uh, file 31, the my only thing I can do is work my way through all of these links until I get to block three, okay? And so the FAT file system is very bad for random access unless you have a driver um, slash file system that pulls the whole fat in and re-indexes it in a way that's fast. And, and you can do that. There's nothing, no reason not to, um, other than it takes a lot of memory and is uh, not simple, um, which is one of the reasons that people like to use fats in camera because it's such a simple thing. Uh, what about fragmentation? That's where the file is split across many parts of the disk. Well, as you see, just plain happens. Uh, this is why there are all these defrag routines that you can run on old Windows boxes and so on to rearrange the blocks so that you really are linking sequentially and you can get some sequential performance out of this. But um, if you don't do that, then the blocks are potentially all over the place. Small files, yeah, it handles them well enough, right? Big files, well, there's a lot of links. I mean, the biggest problem with a big file is you... Uh, you can't get randomly to the end of it without following a bunch of links. So that's a, that's a bit of an issue. Okay, so let's look at a different case study. So I wanna talk about the Berkeley file, FAST file system. 
Okay, so inodes in Unix, including the Berkeley FAST file system. So the file number is no longer just a pointer into something like a, the FAT. It's actually an index into a set of inode arrays. And so those inode arrays, each file or directory is in an I, is an inode. Okay, and so um, the file number is an index into this array. Each inode corresponds to a single file and contains all its metadata. So the things like the read or write permissions are stored with the file, not in the directory like they were in the FAT system. It allows multiple names uh, or directory entries for a file. So again, the idea there is the inode is the file. The directory entries can point at it. You can name that file 12, 12 different ways. And as long as you get to that through the directory structure, you can now use the same file because its, uh, its identity is defined by the inode. Okay, so this is, this is a much cleaner um, approach to, uh, to dealing with files. Okay, so the inode in Unix typically maintains a multi-level tree structure. I'll show you this in a second, defined storage blocks for files. And it's been designed in this asymmetric way, which you'll see in a moment, to make it great for little and large files. Okay, if you remember, um, I showed you that there's a huge number of little files, but some really big files, and we need to handle both of those well, okay? So the original inode format, which I'm going to show you, appeared in the Berkeley Standard Distribution Unix 4.1. Uh, and you know, I've said this a couple of times. I said this with sockets. You know, BSD, Berkeley Standard Distribution, was famous for all sorts of innovations in operating systems. Um, so this is a you know go bears kind of scenario. This is part of your heritage here. Um, and just as a more recent Thing. This is very similar structure for what uh, Linux EXT2 or 3 ended up. Um, EXT3 is pretty much what you would get if you um, formatted you know, a new version of Linux and you weren't trying to make a huge system for the EXT4. Okay, so go bears. Um, so here's the inode structure typically. It looks like this, where an inode has a bunch of metadata and then it has a bunch of what are called direct pointers, which are um, pointers directly to block numbers. Okay, and so the block numbers, remember I talked about the logical block uh, numbers earlier, point uh, in a big space from one to n. And so the direct pointers point directly at a set of blocks. And then there are uh, double indirect uh, pointers, which is, this is showing you an um, indirect pointer here, for instance, points at a block. And inside that block is a bunch of pointers to blocks. And then doubly indirect pointers point at a block, which points at blocks, which point at a bunch of data blocks. And then finally, a triple, uh, triply indirect goes to a block, which points to a block, which points to a block, which points to a bunch of data blocks. So all of the data blocks are over here on the far right. And this index structure, notice how it's asymmetric. So the first n direct pointers, you go, you have the inode, you can directly figure out which data blocks are there. And then um, if you go past, let's say, block 10, then you start having to pull in a block, which then let then let you get n blocks out of it. Okay. Can anybody figure out why we did a bunch of direct pointers and then we had some indirect, doubly indirect, and triply indirect pointers? What why why this crazy structure? Any idea? Something about small versus large files. Yeah. What does this do uh, exactly? Good. So somebody else said here, the head of the file is fast, but you can still accommodate uh, large files. That's correct. In fact, for files that are small enough, it's only one hop. Once we've got the inode in memory, which we get on open, we can look directly in the inode to find out the first n blocks just directly. So this is extremely efficient for small files, right? But we can accommodate large files. And for really large files, the triply indirect pointers give us a huge number of data blocks. Okay, And so this structure was set up precisely to handle uh, small files really well and still be able to handle um, big files mostly well, fairly well. And if you imagine caching, we haven't talked about that yet, all of these intermediate blocks, then in fact, once you've gone to the trouble of doing the triply indirect blocks, uh, and you pull in the first triple indirect block and then the doubles and the indirect blocks, then uh, these can be put in the cache and you can get the rest of these very fast. Okay. Now, the question is, to clarify, does the file number point to a single inode or to an array of multiple inodes? The answer is the file number points to a single inode. 
Okay, so the file is defined by its inode. Each file has only one inode. And when you talk about an I number, it is an index into this inode array that points at where the inode is. Does that make sense? All right, are we good? One more clarification. So the I number points at the inode array. Every file has one inode. Okay. Is the number of direct pointers part of the spec? Yes. So file systems typically have a specific inode format. So that's part of the file system. Okay. So it's and um, you don't often have the option to vary it. In fact, I'm not sure of a uh, a commonly used file system off the hand off hand that lets you change the number of direct pointers. Um, inodes are one to one for every file. Yes. So each file has an inode. Each inode that is in use belongs to a file. Typically, there's a whole bunch of these that are free because if there weren't any free ones, you couldn't create any new files. So there's a bunch of free ones, but for the ones that are in use, they're only being used by one file, and each file has one inode, and the file number is unique to the file. Yes. I don't know if I can say this in any other way. Does this make sense? What we're looking at here is exactly one file. Okay, and it has exactly one I number, which represents this spot. Okay, do I, should I pause on this or are we good? Okay, I'm assuming that, assuming that we're good. The I node array does not include a pointer to an I node. The I node array has I nodes in it. The I number is a pointer in the I node array. Okay, so you could think of this as an array of structs if you want, but it's on disk. Okay, so the inodes are actually in the inode array, which is stored on disk. Now, the uh, the top of the inode is the file attributes, which are things like what user is it uh, created it, what group is it in, um, the typical read, write, execute permissions of you know the user group and world, um, things like the set UID and uh, set GID bits, which say that whenever you try to execute this file, if it's an executable, does it uh, get an effective user ID that is the same as the owner or an effective group ID that's the same as the group. Those bits are all stored in the metadata, okay? Whether this can be read or written, et cetera, okay? Um, the other thing is, for instance, here's an example of 12 pointers, okay? The, this wasn't the original BSD necessarily, but um, certainly Linux has 12 of these direct pointers. The original BSD had 10, that's part of the spec. But um, what this is saying is, that um, in this inode, we have, for instance, 12 pointers that point at data blocks. And if it's 4K blocks, that means that the direct pointers are sufficient for files up to 48 kilobytes. Everybody with me? Why? Because we have 12 pointers, 12 times 4, kilobot, uh, 4 kilobytes. OK, so we can do pretty well with lots of small files having only one uh, lookup hop or one indirect indirection to get to the data blocks once we've loaded inode into RAM, then we can get these data blocks. Okay. Um, and again, that's getting us this thing that we talked about earlier, which is that most of the files are small. So most of the inodes don't have any indirect, doubly indirect, or triply indirect pointers. Those are zeros. They basically have everything in this small number of direct pointers. Okay. Um, if you, uh, so does the file system not support 512 byte box? Okay. So that's an interesting question. And the answer is uh, that originally these blocks were small and they were 512 bytes in the original BSD, okay? Because the uh, sector sizes were 512 bytes. When we got to the fast file system, which um, I, I wanna finish up here before we end today, um, these blocks were bigger. And so then there was a special way to deal with fragmentation where you'd have uh, data blocks were partially used, but let's leave that for another conversation. Um, so, and by the way, just to finish one thing though, is if the sectors are 512 bytes on disk, when we read data blocks and they're four kilobytes, we don't, nothing that the file system, uh, the file system has no idea that the disk is operating in 512 bytes because the disk device driver only pulls in and out 4K bytes. So there's never, that level of granularity is never exposed to this uh, file system. Okay. Now, um, so once we get to the indirect pointers, um, we can actually get up to terabytes of data. 
Okay, so once we get to these, this level up here, we're in pretty good shape, and that basically handles um, the really large files in our original study there. So we're good to go with one, two, and three level indirect pointers. Okay, um, putting it all together, um, uh, we basically have an on disk index where we have these inode arrays with a bunch of inodes in them that index uh, files for us. Um, and in the case of the original uh, Unix, it was 10 direct pointers. Um, and we can sort of ask our question, how many accesses for block 23? Well, what you do is you, you get through the direct ones and then you start talking about the uh, um, two of them because you have to get uh, one for the indirect blocks. So if we have 10 direct pointers in this example, um, to get to block 23, we have to basically get past the first 10 and then we know that the block 23 is going to be uh, in this uh, in the set of data blocks that are singly indirect. So we're going to have to read this indirect block, and then we'll be able to get the uh, go down to block 13 in this grouping to get block 23. Okay. And so, um, and actually, if it's zero indexed, uh, we'll go to uh, block 12 here to get to the one we want. But um, notice that we can easily figure it out if we know what block we're interested in, we can figure out where in this structure we have to go to get our block. So this inode being well-defined based on the file system means that we can easily go from block number uh, to which, where the data block is, right? So how about block five? Well, that's just a direct block. So we just do one read. How about block 340? Well, it turns out we have to go down to the doubly indirect blocks at that point here read this guy, this guy, and so on. So you guys can figure that out. Um, all right. Now, if you guys will give me another uh, few moments here, I want to actually talk about the fast file system. So, so far, we're really talking about Berkeley uh, BSD 4.1. But uh, as you can imagine, if you look at this data structure, um, there's nothing in this data structure that says these data blocks are laid out in any intelligent way on disk. In fact, the original Berkeley Unix uh, 4.1 BSD file system had this unfortunate property that it would start out really fast. Why is that? Well, because as I allocated new files, I'd lay out all my blocks on disk in a sequential order and reading them back would be fast. But over time, as you read and wrote and read and wrote and deleted, what would happen is the file system would get more and more slow over time, progressively slower, until it was half or worse uh, of the original performance. And the reason is that these blocks would start becoming uh, randomly scattered on the disk because the free list in the original BSD was literally a linked list and had no idea of locality on disk. Okay, so you can imagine that's a problem. So what did they do? Well, um, to, and this is basically, we gotta deal with performance. Okay, and so what happened is among other things, we got to go back to this from last time, uh, two times ago. If we want to optimize reading on a disk, we remember that the seek time and the, plus the rotational latency plus the transfer time all add up to give me my total time. And this seek and rotational latency can be long, especially the seek time. And so um, the seek time, we would like to avoid as much as possible. So if you are reading sequentially, say here, and you're reading through this because this was a video or whatever, what I'd like is as I read successive blocks, it'd be great if they all were on the same track because then I could get them really rapidly. Well, that can only happen if I'm, my file system is conscious of that and tries to figure out how to lay them out in a way that mostly means that sequential access either stays on the same track or if it has to change uh, tracks or cylinders, will go to an adjoining uh, cylinder with a little tiny head moment rather than going all over the place. Okay, and so we're gonna try to optimize so that we first read from the same track, then from the same cylinder, neither of those require us to move the head, and then only from tracks that are adjacent. Okay, and so the fast file system, which is BSD 4.2, um, 1984, had the same inode structure. So from the standpoint of what kind of files are supported, they basically kept that same idea that we just showed you of really efficient small files, um, but the ability to support the large ones. One of the things they did do is they went from a block size of 512 to 1024, so they doubled the block size, and that immediately gave them a lot more sequential movement 
okay, because we could um, read uh, successive blocks very quickly. Um, t we could read basically twice as many bytes at a time, okay? So that was good. So the paper on the FAST file system is up there on the resources page for you guys to take a look. Um, and again, this is a you know, Berkeley project, it was well known at the time. And it did a bunch of optimizations for performance and reliability. Among other things, distributing inodes rather than having a single inode array that was on the outer uh, tracks of the disk or outer cylinders of the disk, it actually distributed them throughout. Um, it used bitmap allocation in uh, the place of a free list. So the nice thing about a bitmap is now you have sort of one spot for every sector and now you can make a decision. You can say, oh, look, there's a big range uh, an empty space on the disk with a big range of uh, free blocks that I could allocate uh, sequentially, okay? And so the free list gave them a much better idea of what was uh, sequentially free and not. Another trick that they did was they kept 10% of the disk space free and that probabilistically gave them a lot of runs of empty space, which gave them a much better uh, ability to read sequentially off the disk. Okay, so, um, in your, so in the early days, which we were talking about here, um, early Unix and DOS Windows, the FAT file system, et cetera, basically put all the headers on the outermost cylinders. And uh, two problems with that are one, since the inodes are all in one place, if a head crash destroyed the disk, you've just destroyed all your inodes and now you lost track of all of the places of your files. So that's a problem, right? Um, problem number two was when you create a file, you don't really know how big it'll uh, become. And so the question is, how do you allocate sequentially um, enough space to get good performance? And we'll talk about that next time since we've just run out of time here. But just to give you a little bit uh, of things to think about on our way out uh, is that they basically divided the group into, uh, divided the disk itself into a bunch of block groups and distributed the inodes around in the groups and made a, uh, came up with a way of basically allocating uh, files sequentially within a group. And uh, given the heuristics for doing that, they actually improved the performance of this quite a bit. We'll talk about that next time. For now, um, just to, in conclusion, we've been talking about file systems, about transforming blocks into files and directories, optimizing for access and usage patterns, maximizing sequential access and allowing very efficient random access uh, we talked about file and directories being defined by a header called an inode. Uh, we talked about naming, which is translating from user visible names to actual system resources. The directories are used for naming uh, and uh, a linked or tree structure stored uh, in the files. Uh, and uh, that's how we basically define which blocks belong in a file. We talked about the FAT scheme, which is very widely used. It's a linked list approach. Um, cameras, USB drives, SD cards, et cetera, they're all USB. It's very simple to implement in firmware, uh, but very poor for performance, and it basically has no security, as you can see. Um, we want to look at the actual file access patterns, lots of small files, but a few really big ones taking up all the space. And so next time, we'll talk about uh, laying out file systems to take advantage of that, including the fast file system. All right. And, uh, and then we'll talk about a couple of others. I have two other file systems that we'll talk about very briefly at the beginning of the next lecture, including NTFS, which is the Windows file system, and F2FS, which is one that's optimized for Flash. All right, so um, I think that's when we're gonna call it a night. Uh, I hope everybody has a great uh, weekend, and uh, we're going to not try to get too crazy watching the, file, the uh, vote counts coming in, but uh, otherwise, I hope you all have uh, a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you on Monday. Um, is the BSD file system and still in use? That's a question on the chat. The answer is yes. Uh, in, in, uh, it's definitely still in use in BSD, Unix, and uh, Linux, ext2 slash 3 is also essentially the BSD file system. So, all right, you guys have a uh, great evening. Bye now. <laughs>